Here is a simple example of the motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field. In this figure one, uh, a particle with positive charge Q is at a point O here, moving with velocity V in a uniform magnetic field directed into the plane. So these crosses are the tail ends of the magnetic field which is going into the paper. An upward force F equals QV cross B of magnitude QVB. The force is always perpendicular to V, so it cannot change the magnitude of the velocity but only its direction. Thus, the magnitude of both F and V are constant. At points such as P and Q, the directions of force and velocity have changed as shown. So you can see here that the, as it moves, we get these positions here. The magnitude of the force is constant, since the magnitudes of Q, V and B are constant. The particle therefore moves under the influence of a force whose magnitude is constant, but whose direction is always at right angles to the velocity of the particle. The orbit of the particle is therefore a circle, described with constant tangential speed V. So as we move round, we're naturally going to form a circle. That's quite fascinating. And that's, that's what's happening here. The orbit of the particle is therefore a circle described with constant tangential velocity speed v. Since the centripetal acceleration equals v squared over r, and we have from Newton's second law that f equals mass times acceleration, we can equate qvb here, we can equate this to mv squared over r. So, uh, yeah, so we've done that here. So we're going to equate the force, the force on the particle QVB. Uh, we can equate it also because remember the force is going inwards. We can equate that to the centripetal force because they're basically the same thing. You can see here this is like the centripetal force. So we can set them to be equal. Where m is the mass of the particle, the radius of the circular orbit then is r mv over b over q. So that's the radius of the uh, circular orbit. If the direction of the initial velocity is not perpendicular to the field, the velocity component parallel to the field remains constant and the particle moves in a helix. So you've got your magnetic field going down and the velocity is going that way. But let's say the velocity is going that way and the magnetic field is down. If it's going that way, we end up moving through a helix and you can see that in bubble experiments uh, they've done bubble experiments where they fire particles through vacuums and then they and you can actually see these uh, helical shapes so of course that's generally what's going to happen because most of the time the velocity is not going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field it is going to have some angle like that and that causes a helical shape to be seen note the radius is proportional to the momentum mv so a larger velocity or mass then we're going to get a large r so that's kind of um, intuitive as well note also that the magnetic force acting on a charged particle can never do work because force is always at right angles to the motion uh, never to increase or decrease the magnitude of the velocity as i said before because the magnetic field is this way and the velocity is going that way you know even if the velocity is this angle or that angle it's it's always at right angles. Thus motion of a charged particle under the action of a magnetic field alone is always motion with constant speed. Problem solving strategy here. Uh, so we're just going to go through three points here when you're uh, uh, solving, um, using a strategy to, to solve uh, charged particles in magnetic fields. Uh, one, in analysing the motion of a charged particle in electric and magnetic fields, you are combining the use of Newton's laws of motion with what you have learned about electric and magnetic forces. So you're still dealing with F equals MA, uh, with F given by Q brackets electric field plus V cross B, this general uh, uh, equation for the, for the particle includes the electric and magnetic fields. Two. Often, the use of components is the most efficient approach. Set up a coordinate system and then express all the vector quantities, including vector E, vector B, velocity vector, 
the force vector and the acceleration vector in terms of their components in this system. So you're going to have i, j's and k's for all of these and turn them all into vectors. So you end up with uh, you know components, for example, fx and max. This approach is particularly useful when you have both electric and magnetic fields present. It just makes it easier if you just write it all down. If things are complicated, uh, you're just using cosines and sines, but if you just turn them all into, into vectors, it's uh, much, much easier. The next section are application of the principles introduced here and using this, this above strategies.